Shall we accept that invitation? Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you that the heavens declare your glory today. The skies are shouting your goodness, and we are inclined to join them because you have been good to us, Lord. Your goodness and mercy have pursued us, followed us, chased us relentlessly this whole week long, Lord. And so we want to stop now and just let your goodness and mercy catch up with us for a moment. Because sometimes, Lord, we get so busy, we're in such a hurry that we can even outrun the good things that you're trying to do in us, and we don't want to do that. We thank you for peace. We thank you for hope. We thank you for life. And we pray, God, that nothing would disrupt the beauty and the joy and the peace that we feel as we worship you together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God is good. All the time. So good to uh, worship with you today. It's been a remarkable weekend. I see our Spark students uh, scattered around the room and uh, remember times when Melanie and I hosted Spark and the relationships that were made. And maybe there's nothing quite so uh, exhilarating and as exhausting as a Spark weekend. And, um, and we may wonder how in the world we may wonder in our own lives today, how in the world are we ever going to make it through? Do you ever wonder that? How am I going to do this? How am I going to make it through? Just yesterday, uh, they uh, built a ninja, a ninja sort of obstacle course and things, and our students were participating. And one of the things was a 14-foot wall. And the minute I saw it, I thought, I can't do that. I mean, there's no way. I mean, even with a running start, and a ladder. I don't think I can get that 14-foot wall, but some of our students made it. Here's a picture, I think, of one of them, yeah, who made it all the way up, and uh, one of our eighth-grade girls made it all the way up the 14-foot wall, which is just, just pretty amazing. And, um, and if you ever wonder, so how will we overcome what we're dealing with in our lives right now, I think our students could answer us because I heard them singing earlier today from Revelation uh, chapter 12. How will we overcome? We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. And we sang it with Sarah and Kelsey this morning, and with God we triumph. Without God, not so much. So I just want to say thank you publicly uh, to Tyler and Kelsey and Trent, and especially to all our student workers, those who uh, have hosted and driven cars and, and gotten food to us and different things. Because here's what I want to say to our student workers, particularly those who don't get paid a penny for what you're doing. You just do it out of love. And here's what I want to say to you. I'm here this morning because of people like you, because of Bob Frazier and Jim and Ann Coxwell, who who taught me and took me on retreats and sat down and tried to explain the book of Revelation to me and loved me when I was not very lovely, and I am so, so grateful. Let's give God glory for these workers today. And I just want to say, I also want to say to our students and parents of students, so God is doing something in our student ministry right now. And if you're wondering, should I jump in or not? Is this the time to jump in? Let me just say, this is the time to jump in. Because you'll be on the front end of God doing the new thing in our student ministry that's going to make a difference in the lives of our students. And I dare say, in our community, I am excited about what God is doing, and I am grateful for this week. And let's give God glory again. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. When I think of impossible things, things that there's just no way, like 14-foot walls, there's no way I wouldn't even try to get out of this. Think about your impossible situation, your inextricable dilemma, the one thing that you're facing right now, and you just know there is just 
no way. And I thought about, some of you may remember years ago a movie with Clint Eastwood called Escape from Alcatraz. Turns out Alcatraz is an actual island. It's off the coast of San Francisco, and it's actually a prison. And uh, it was thought to be an inescapable prison. 37 different people tried to escape. Some of them were recaptured. Others were shot. Others drowned. But on the night of June the 11th, 1962, three guys, Clarence Anglin, John Anglin, and Frank Morris, after six months of preparation, somehow got off that island. They were never they were never found. We don't know if they made it in the movie, Clint Eastwood. I'm ruining the movie for you, but it's an old movie, so you should have watched it by now if you haven't watched it. <laughs> it's not my fault that you, that you don't know the answer to this. It's called Escape from Alcatraz. He made it, okay? <laughs> but some of us may be facing things that seem even more impossible than escaping from Alcatraz today. And in the scriptures, in Acts chapter 12, would you meet me in Acts chapter 12 right now? Let's meet God. The Bible has always been for me a meeting place with God. And there in Acts chapter 12, Peter finds himself in a very similar situation. He's in a situation that he can't get out of. But God has an answer for Peter, and if we'll receive it, for us as well. Let's stand together and hear the word of God. Acts chapter 12. We read the passage before this last week where they took up the offering for uh, the people who were hungry and uh, the story of the, of the king who was eaten by the worms. I'm sure you remember that part. And now I'm going to fill in the gap. So Acts chapter 12, verse 1, growing in grace, praying with power, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of the unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. This is our key verse today, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance, and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. Um... He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening the door and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, these praying people told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. And then they opened the door and saw him. They were astonished. And Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. This is the word of the Lord. 
please be seated. Antonia's fortress, built by Herod, was the Alcatraz of Jerusalem. It was massive. We only have mock-ups of it now. We don't, it doesn't exist any longer. But in that day, if you were put in that fortress, you were being held not just by the Jewish authorities, not in the house of the high priest, but in a Roman prison in Jerusalem near the Temple Mount. On the northwest side of the Temple Mount was this enormous fortress. And Herod when he began to persecute the church, and by the way, this is the first time the government has persecuted Christians since the death of Christ. The religious leaders have been wreaking havoc with them, but now there's a new king in 42 AD, Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of the Herod who killed all the babies when Jesus was born, the uh, nephew of the one who killed John the Baptist. This is a another Herod, Herod Agrippa I. And because he grew up with Claudius Caesar and with Gaius Caesar, also known as Caligula, in 42 AD, they restored to him. See, it had been subdivided among his uncles and his dad. But when, when he came to power in 42, Rome gave him all the lands of his grandfather back, and he was now king. So Luke uses the correct historical language. He doesn't call people kings who weren't actually kings. But this Herod was a king, and he calls him King Herod. And King Herod Agrippa I decides he can make some points with the, the people, with some of the people, with the religious leaders, if he will wreak havoc on the church. And so he arrests James, the brother of John, one of the two sons of thunder, the first apostle to be martyred. Stephen, remember, was killed. He wasn't an apostle. But James is killed. And when he finds out people like that, he arrests Peter as well. And we may assume that had he had his way, he would have arrested and killed uh, all 12 of the apostles if he could have gotten away with it. But in fact, as it comes to the Passover, and he, he's, we know about him from Josephus, a, a historian of that time, that he was meticulous about keeping the Jewish law. So unlike those who killed Jesus on the Passover, he wasn't willing to break that rule. So he was waiting for Peter's trial until after the Passover, and he is kept in prison, not by one or two or four, but by 16 Roman guards in the Antonia fortress. What we know for sure is he's not getting out of there. He's not getting out of there. But it says in verse 5, in this impossible situation, the prayers of the church were being lifted earnestly to God for him. And as Thomas Watson would say, the angel fetched Peter, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. And so they prayed, and an angel came, and he comes in, and the same word, remember the word I gave you last week, the angel smote Herod when he refused to give God glory, and then he died. It's the exact same word. I just want you to see, he didn't like just tap Peter on the side, but he smacked him, and he says to Peter, get up, get dressed, and get out, and Peter does. But Peter thinks it's a vision. But because of the prayers of the church, Peter's dream actually comes true. And he finds himself going through kind of Maxwell Smart style. All the doors are opening for him. And suddenly he finds himself outside and he thinks, I got to go somewhere. Where am I going to go? I think I'll go to the place where they pray. So he goes to Mary's house, not that Mary. This is another Mary who's the mother of John Mark, the aunt of Barnabas, if you're keeping score. And he gets there, and they're praying, and they're so busy praying that when somebody knocks on the door, they send Rhoda, whose name means Rose. And when Rose gets to the door, Peter is there, and she's so excited, she... She leaves him there. 
There's humor in scripture, right? This is kind of funny. And so she goes and tells them, hey, Peter's at the door. And they're like, you're out of your mind. Here are these people praying. They've been praying. But in their minds, it's incomprehensible that God might have answered their prayer. And so they just keep on praying. And she keeps on, and Peter keeps on knocking. And as Peter keeps on knocking, finally they go and let him in. And then they get really excited and apparently really loud. And Peter thinks being loud right now is probably not a great idea. So he's like, shh, whoa. So tell James, not the James who was killed by Herod, obviously. James, the brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James, who said, you have not because you ask not. Tell James. And James moves into the position of leadership. And Peter goes somewhere, but Luke doesn't tell us where he goes. Luke doesn't tell us where he goes. And the truth is, God has answered their prayer. From time to time, somebody will say, that person doesn't have a prayer. I have a family member who who typically says that about uh, children who are really struggling, and he will say, you know, that kid just doesn't have a prayer. And there's something in me that that sort of resists that notion, because I think, Well, I bet they do. I bet somebody somewhere is praying or would pray for that person, for God to get them out of their seemingly hopeless situation. It was Karl Barth who said, to clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. That's what the church in Jerusalem was doing when Peter was in prison. They were clasping their hands and they were starting an uprising against the disorder of the world. Bart goes on to say, God is not deaf, but listens. More than that, he acts. God does not act in the same way whether we pray or not. Prayer exerts an influence upon God's action. That's what the word answer means. Now, theologians debate this, and there are some who say it's a zero sum, so God's going to do what God's going to do regardless of whether or not we pray because he's sovereign, so he's just going to do what he's going to do, which kind of makes prayer a bit perfunctory or pointless, it seems to me. And then there are others who say, no, there's a, a tension model So remember, God says to Moses, I'm just sick of these people. I tell you what, I'm going to wipe them out and start over with you. And Moses goes, don't do that. And God says, well, I'm just not going to go up with you. And Moses says, don't. If you don't go up with us, don't let us go anywhere. And it seems that God lives in tension with his people and he responds to prayer. I don't know what happened with James. I don't know if they had a prayer meeting. Luke doesn't tell us. But right now they are urgent and intent because they know that Peter who preached at Pentecost is one of God's spokesperson for the kingdom. And if he dies, it's going to do devastation to the work that they're trying to do through the gospel. And in response to the prayers of his people, God sends an angel. And so I ask you again, so what is it that you're dealing with that is hopeless, that seems impossible? It would take divine intervention for this situation to be fixed. So long as the church prays, the world and you still have a chance. The the church prays and the world has a prayer, which makes me think we ought to keep on praying. I turned around on Wednesday night and I looked back at that group of people who were gathered in that room and it occurred to me, God is starting something and usually when God starts something among his people, it begins with prayer with people who earnestly focus on God. And just hear me clearly, two thoughts today. First of all, I'm not diminishing the problems in our world. It is true. We battle against formidable foes in this world, substantial spiritual forces of evil in our world. Since Jesus' death, the church has had some internal struggles and they've had some persecution from the religious leaders, but they've also largely enjoyed the favor of the people in Jerusalem. 
The, the Jews in Jerusalem, they, they largely could see something good was going on, but there were some religious leaders. And then Herod comes to power, and it looks like he's going to do a lot of damage to the church for a long time. And again, you, you can get caught up in, in Scripture. Which Herod is this? Because there's Herod the Great uh, at, the, at the beginning of, of Matthew, and then there's, well, you, you've, you've also got Herod Antipas who oversees uh, John the Baptist's death, and now Herod Agrippa I. But Herod Agrippa II is the one before whom Paul will have an audience. You go, Pastor, I'm never going to keep up with all that. I mean, you could draw it on a genealogical chart, and I'm still not with you. Well, I think my grandson can help us with this. We were walking in the park at Christmas time, and I'm pushing him in the double bob, and every person we came to, he said, that's a bad guy. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how do you know? You're two. How do you know that's a bad guy? And I would say to him, eventually I just started saying, no, there's no bad guys in Doc's Park. All the, all the guys are good guys. But here's what you know for sure. If you run into a Herod in the Bible, he's a bad guy. <laughs> all of them. Like, my, like Thomas says, they're all bad guys. And, and what's bad is he's trying to disrupt the work that God is doing through the gospel in Jerusalem. And, um, and so he's trying to, to do that, and he's trying to do devastating harm. And you, you know, who, who is it that, what is it? Is it, is, it a, is it a person? Is it an illness? Is it a, a financial challenge? Is it a catastrophe in your life? What is it? Is it a broken relationship? What is it that you're just going, this is bad, and there is no way I can look at it or configure it to make anything good come out of it? But then the scripture says, our God is working all things together for good. For the, not everything that happens to us is good, but he's working all things together for good. But I, I'm not diminishing that there are forces at work in our world. There are places in the world today where if you stand and speak the name of Jesus, you will go to jail. And why? Well, because as Paul told the Ephesians, finally, brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of of God, he says, because we know that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not the people that are the problem. But we're battling, he says, against rulers, authorities, uh, powers in this dark world, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There are forces at work in our world, and I don't want to diminish that. I, I mean to say uh, that there are forces in our world that mean things for evil, but as Genesis 50, 20 vision, as Joseph would figure out, they may mean it for evil, but God can turn it for good. So Peter would later write in 1 Peter chapter 5, this same Peter would write, be alert and of sober mind. Peter, who was sleeping soundly between the two guards, says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. I think sometimes, uh, like that 14-foot wall, all we can see is that this is not going to happen today. I can't overcome this today. But I'm just reminded that the forces arrayed against us in this world, the formidable forces arrayed against us in this world, are not greater than our God. There's a beautiful story in 2 Kings chapter 6 where Elisha uh, has been... Uh, how do I say this? Spiritually, he's been meddling with the, the Arameans, with the Syrians, and the Syrian king is really tired of it, so he sends his chariots and his horses out to capture Elisha, and Elisha wakes up one morning with his, his servant, and he sees all of these uh, Syrian chariots and horses surrounding him, and his, and his uh, servant wakes up and looks around and says in Hebrew, uh-oh, <laughs> whoops. We are in, do you see the chariots and horses, master? We are in a lot of trouble. And in this 
remarkable moment, all Elisha can think to do is to pray. And he says, Lord, open his eyes so that he can see that those who are for us are more than those who are against us. And in that moment, God opens the servant's eyes and he sees the chariots of fire surrounding the people of God. I, I, you know, I'm, I read this present darkness years ago. Maybe you did as well. Stories about spiritual things going on while we're in church. I mean, you know, you can't see it. Who knows? What I know for sure is the enemy is going to do what the enemy is going to do. We used to pray together with two men on a Wednesday morning. One of the guys, Bill Gladden, I've told you about him. I, I've never prayed with anybody quite like Bill. And, and Bill, we were praying one morning, and Brother George kept saying, Lord, put a hedge of protection around our pastor. Put a hedge of protection around our pastor to protect him from the enemy. And one morning, I guess Bill just got tired of hearing that prayer. We prayed together every Wednesday morning on our knees. And finally, Bill just said, Lord, we know the devil's going to do what the devil's going to do. You do what you do. And it turns out when God does what God can do, it's enough. Amen. It's enough to send a, an angel to get Peter up and get him dressed and get him out and get him to safety. It's enough for God to continue his work in the world. Point one, we battle against formidable forces. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's financial. I don't know what it is. You know what it is. But I love verse 5. Peter was kept in prison by 16 soldiers and gates and bars. But the church prayed earnestly for him. I love Michael W. Smith's song, This is How We Fight Our Battles. This is how we fight our battles. What, what the, I'll tell you what the Christians don't do. The ones who are at Mary's house is get together a mob and go break him out of Antonia's fortress. Primarily because they can't. This is beyond their ability. What they can do is pray. And I know, church, sometimes we are tempted to say, well, the resources we have in the world, those are the things that are gonna get us out. And I'm just here to tell you that if you're making a list of the things that work for the church in the world today, at the top of the list, put pray. Amen. That's the top of the list. You say, well, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we've got this strategy. And that. Listen to Sky Jathani. Why do we pray? To manipulate God, to give us positive thoughts? The reason we pray, though there are many, is because we pray as the people of God. We are displaying the manifold wisdom of God to the powers and authorities in the heavenly realm. We are declaring notice to the enemies, uh, kind of like Gandalf says to Balrog, you shall not pass here. You're not winning this fight. What we're declaring when we're on our knees is that we will not put our hope and trust in the things of this world. We will not put our trust and hope in our wealth, in our strength, in our wisdom, in our kings, in our politicians, or in anything we possess. But we are putting our trust in God alone. And when the heavenly powers, yeah, give God glory. Because when the heavenly powers see that kind of foolish wisdom, they tremble because they don't comprehend it. Because when we're on our knees in prayer, we are revealing the counterintuitive wisdom of the kingdom of God. What difference does it make if a bunch of people fall on their knees? Well, Peter would say, a lot. It makes a lot of difference as he's walking freely out of the prison and the gate opens and the angel leaves and he goes, whoa, I better make my way to the prayer meeting because that's why I'm out right now. So the second thought, we battle on our knees, so of course, we cannot lose. Sidlow Baxter said, men may spurn our appeals, they may reject our message, they may oppose our arguments, they may despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. They are helpless. We're not helpless. They're helpless against the prayers of God's people. So when we battle on our knees, we don't lose. Why? Because first of all, just four thoughts quickly. First of all, we pray earnestly. 
we pray earnestly. The word means stretching. It's, it's not unlike, it's a different word, but it's not unlike what Paul says about Epaphras in the last chapter of Colossians 4 about Epaphras, where Paul says, he's always wrestling for you in prayer. He's agonizing in prayer. That's the Greek word agonizo. He's agonizing for you in prayer. And while they're praying earnestly, here's another Greek word. I never saw this till this week, that the, the door opens automates, automatically. <laughs> there were automatic doors in the first century. <laughs> when the church prayed, doors opened automatically before anybody created a device to make that happen. I think that's pretty cool. A survey found that only one in 25 churches in the United States, when they listed their top 10 priorities for the New Year's, only one in 25, that's 4%, listed prayer in the top 10. I repeat, if you're making a list, start with prayer. So Ephesians 6, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Pray in the Spirit. Why? Because Paul says in Romans 8, we don't know how to pray. I, I know we think we know how to pray, but we don't know how to pray. But the good news is we're not praying alone because while that prayer meeting was taking place, the Holy Spirit was praying on behalf of Peter and the people, and the Spirit knows how to pray because the Spirit knows the mind of the Father. And every time you and I pray together, we're just joining in a prayer meeting that's already taking place where the Holy Spirit is talking to the Father, and we join in that Trinitarian dialogue, and we are praying, and the beauty of it is God works when his people pray earnestly, stretchingly. Let your prayer stretch you in your trust in God. Second, we pray. I was just looking for an E, endlessly. I should have said constantly, but we pray endlessly. What do I mean by that? Well, we find in verse five, it says the church, it doesn't say they prayed. It says they were praying, continuous action. So when he gets there in verse 12, after he escapes from Alcatraz or Antonia Fortress, what does he find them doing? Well, they're still praying. And I thought we should be reminded that the Apostle Paul says, pray without ceasing. I don't mean by that that everything we do is prayer, but I do mean by that that we can pray while we're doing everything we do. Brother Lawrence said, I'm as close to God washing dishes at the monastery as I am when I'm in the chapel on my knees. We make all of life pray without ceasing. This same James says, you have not because you ask not. Jesus says, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And I think it's just beautiful the way Luke tells the story that just like they kept knocking on heaven's door, praying to God, Peter is out there. What else is he gonna do? He's gonna keep knocking until they let him in. And this is the way we pray. We never stop. We keep on praying because there is power in prayer. Third, we pray expectantly. In other words, when we pray, we ought to believe that God is going to do something. And I gather from this story that they weren't quite so sure. Whatever they know about God, at this point, they've suspended that. How do we know? Because, well, I think Rhoda... She, she figures it out. This is actually Peter, but everybody else can't believe. And when they actually see Peter, it says they were astonished. Wait, weren't they praying? Yeah, they were praying, but wh why were they astonished? Uh, at a spark years ago, Scott Young came and, and taught uh, some of our students. One of my sons was in the room, and, and Scott had been on a mission trip somewhere, and they had poured some concrete, and a storm was coming in, and it was going to ruin the concrete, and they had a prayer meeting, and it was like, and some of you remember this at Camp Tallowood years ago, it looked like the clouds kind of parted. And wherever the rain fell that day, it didn't fall on the concrete and mess up what they had done. And Scott was like, this is unbelievable. And the missionary said, well, it's actually believable. The question is, why are you surprised? <laughs> we prayed. You think when we pray, we're just like talking to a wall? We're asking God to intervene. He's not bound to do what we ask, but if it's within his will, he's going to do that thing, even if it seems impossible for us. I think of Hudson Taylor when he was going to the mission field and the captain on the boat said, our, our ship is drifting. We have no wind. If we get to that island, we're probably gonna be eaten by cannibals. 
And I hear you believe in God, so I'm going to ask you to pray. And Hudson Taylor said, okay, I'll pray, but you need to raise the sails. And the captain said, well, that would, be, that would make me look really silly with my men if I raise the sails when there's no wind. And Hudson Taylor said, you better raise the sails if I'm going to pray. And so he raised the sails, and Hudson Taylor prayed. And about 45 minutes later, the captain came down and said, you can stop praying now. We got all the wind we need. Pray expectantly. Pray. Listen to what James, again, old camel knees. He was famous as a prayer warrior, this brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James. A friend of mine and I are memorizing the book of James together this year. And in James 1, 5 through 8, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do, earnestly, um, endlessly, expectantly. And finally, I just want you to see effectively. They prayed effectively. In other words, verse 17, listen to what Peter says, the Lord brought me out. The Lord brought me out. And I'm just telling you, whatever it is you're dealing with right now, as we pray together, there, there, there will come a moment when you say, the only way I can figure out how this happened is God had to do it. And you'll be able to say with Peter, the Lord brought me out. That's Peter's testimony. And God used him powerfully because of that. And I just close with this image from a movie I saw years ago. It was about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was in prisons, not unlike not unlike Peter, under the Nazi uh, regime in Germany, Bonhoeffer is imprisoned and he's got a fellow prisoner who's facing death and he hears the guy weeping in the prison cell next to him. There's a wall between them and there's a guard in the movie standing looking through the, the door, through the window in the door and he sees Bonhoeffer and Bonhoeffer begins to speak to the other prisoner and says to him, can you hear me? I'm about to pray. Do you want to pray with me? Would you like to pray with me? And the guard says, answers for the man, yeah, he doesn't pray. He doesn't believe in God. So don't waste your time on him. But Bonhoeffer continues and he says, look, I'm going to put my hands against the wall. And you put your hands against the wall. And I'm going to pray for us. And in the movie, Bonhoeffer puts his hands against the wall. But on the other side, you don't see the hands come up against the wall. And then Bonhoeffer begins to pray these words. Oh, Lord, it's dark in me, but in you it's day. I am alone, but you will stay. I am afraid. You never cease. I am at war. In you is peace. And then you see the hands on the other side of the wall come up. And their hands join through the sheetrock as Bonhoeffer prays for him. And the next morning, there's a solitary sound of a bullet. And then the guard comes by and says to Bonhoeffer, you wouldn't believe it, but that guy you prayed with yesterday, he died peacefully. He had come to believe because Bonhoeffer, and you say, well, but, but pastor, I want a happy ending. I mean, he was supposed to get out. He was like, well, Bonhoeffer didn't get out. But can I ask you this morning, like up in heaven where those two guys are right now, do they think they got out? Amen. I think they got out. God got them out. And the good news for people like us is so long as the church prays, the world has a prayer. You have a prayer. And with us, so many things are impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. Do you believe that? Well, then we ought to pray. God, I thank you that you did not leave us without a prayer. And I'm asking you, God, to do something so great in our church that only you can take credit for it, Lord. I pray for that person who feels alone and broken and empty. And I know, Lord, if right now they put their trust in you, you would save them. I know right now, Lord, that by your spirit, you are drawing people to yourself around this room, across this facility, Lord. You are drawing people. And I pray, Lord, Savior, Savior, hear our humble cry. While on others you are calling, 
Please do not pass us by. And God, call us today to yourself. And when we come to you in prayer, we thank you that you get us out, that you make the impossible possible. In Jesus' name, amen.